today's talk. It's a Seniors Festival event, um, and it's a bit of a special one because we're recording today's. And that means that if you miss anything, you can watch it on YouTube later by writing down your email address and we'll send it to you. So you don't have to take too many notes or anything like that. No worries at all. Ah, well, we'll cover that too. <laughs> Before we jump into the main event, a little bit about myself. My name is Micah, which is a kind of strange name. My job here at the library is Digital Literacy Officer, and that basically means I get to talk about technology a whole lot, which is great. I love that sort of thing. Um, I, in my personal life, I love being outdoors, playing soccer, and playing lots of sporting events, that sort of stuff. But I also love to read, and I'm really passionate about technology, and that's kind of what's brought me here today. Today's topic is super broad, really, really broad. We're going to kind of cover internet skills and playing on an iPad in general, as well as lots of safety online, shopping on the internet, what to look out for, as well as the cloud, what it is, what it means, do I want to use it, everything like that. To start us off, we're going to look at safety online, which is this one. Now, internet safety is, of course, it's the most fundamental thing. It's kind of, it's always in the news, this happened, that happened, passwords, passwords. The kind of main thing that we look at is creating a good password. It's really often your only defense, really, creating a good password. Uh, we need passwords for pretty much every service that's ever been made. So chances are you've got an email password, an internet, uh, internet service provider password, an Apple Store password. There's thousands of different passwords that we're supposed to remember. Seems like that. Microsoft say that a good password kind of has a, a mix of uppercase characters, lowercase characters, symbols and numbers, and in all sorts of different orders. But they also say it needs to be eight characters long and not be your name, a company name, not even dictionary word, they suggest, so something completely random. And that can be a little bit tough because the more obscure the word is, the harder it is to remember. They've given us a kind of cool example here, which is um, my son's birthday is the 12th of December, 2004. And they say that that's not a good password, that's kind of, it's a sentence, it's too long. But if we shortened it to the first character, the first letter of each word, which is MSBI, and then 12 dash ZDC, comma, four for the year, then that's a good password. It's also challenging to remember. <laughs> So, yeah, there are, there are lots of different strategies that people use. Some people have like an idea where they use a similar password or even the same word, but they change the number on the end and potentially the number could correspond to, say, the first letter of the service's name. So, eBay E is the fifth letter of the alphabet, they put a five on the end. Some people, have, they create really kind of cool ways to kind of modify their password just slightly. On Alan, I think this is late last year, if you're a bit of a daytime TV fan, uh, even if you're not, this is kind of funny. She had this funny little video. Last night I was flipping around through the channels and I saw this. I, I really love infomercials. I don't know if you love them as much as I do, but I found one. It's a new product that I want to share with you. And, uh, you know, if you have a hard time remembering your online passwords, a lot of people have a lot of different passwords. This is going to solve your problems. Online passwords, there's just too many. And who could remember all those tricky combinations? So you stick them on your monitor, or you hide them in a drawer. But not anymore. Introducing Password Minder, the personal line book that takes the hassle out of passwords. Forget about sticky notes or scraps of paper, because Password Minder has been specifically designed to organize and safely store passwords. You'll find them in an instant and never lose a password again, guaranteed. Need to make a password? Just add it to your password binder. The alphabetical listing organizes all your usernames and passwords for instant recall and easy reference. I don't have to worry anymore about security or identity theft. I now have all my passwords in one place. It's great. If you have passwords, you need password binder. So call now and get your very own password binder book for just $10. That's real! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're telling me I can keep all my passwords in one place? Is this right here and it's only $10? For half the price, you can write all your passwords on a $5 bill. <laughs> this is insane. Does this seem safe to keep all your passwords in one place? 
in a place that's labeled internet password? <laughs> I don't think they thought this through fully. I mean, what if somebody gets their hands on your password minder? So I came up with this. It is Ellen's internet password minder protector. And what you do... Yeah. You put it in here. <laughs> and then it has a built-in combination lock right there, you see on the side, and I know you're thinking, Ellen, what if I forget my combination? Well, if you order now, I will include this. You can put it in there. It's the password minder protector minder. It's the one place to keep your password minder protector combination. And I have one more special offer. If you don't feel like writing down your passwords, send them to me. And for $10, I'll write them down for you. <laughs> don't worry about sending me your credit card information. I'll figure it out. <laughs> she good. She's so good. Very funny. That was uh, Ellen from, I think, late last yeah, year. Very entertaining. But it kind of shows the problem that we all have with passwords. They need to be unique. They need to be really obscure. And they're really not memorable for the most part. Uh, there is no miracle cure for that. It's I mean, a new iPhone to got the fingerprint thing, other, there's you know, heart rate recognition and all that stuff. Who knows where we'll end up? But at least for the foreseeable future, we're stuck with really, really strange passwords. I'd like to jump a little bit to, say, information after you've entered your password. So you're logged into a website and information travels, of course, over the internet and it travels through our phone lines, through fiber optic lines, and then undersea cables, and before you know it, in under a second, it's circled the whole globe three times. Um, now, information generally, when it travels on the internet, isn't actually safe at all, it isn't encrypted. Most of the time when you're surfing the internet, you type in the word hello, or chat, or anything like that, it just travels along the internet, and anybody, if they were kind of curious enough, remember, who would be, most of it is just rubbish. Um, they could intercept it if they wanted to. But that's kind of changing a little bit now. Um, there are levels of encryption, and encryption is kind of just, of course, turning words into kind of like really strange, ciphered gibberish, really. Uh, and encryption sort of protects information as it travels over the internet. Uh, so that's great, and we'll talk about how to identify when a website is using encryption in a moment. But once it arrives there, even if it is completely secure once it gets to the website, we can't really know what it's like, how secure the storage is once it arrives to the website that might be, well, almost certainly isn't in Australia, uh, and what they're doing to protect the information once it's inside the computer, inside the database that they've got. It's actually a lot safer to assume that pretty much every bit of information you provide really isn't safe because we, we don't really know better. We can trust the big names, the, the big companies, but it, it, leaks happen all the time, systems can get compromised, so um, it, it's often better to assume generally that information isn't really safe on the internet. There were, oh, well, these three companies, had eBay, Dropbox, and Yahoo, have all had kind of interesting password situation, situations that were evolving over the last year or so. Um, eBay, unfortunately, leaked I think there were over 100 million accounts uh, with address details and phone numbers and full names. No uh, passwords, or well, the passwords were encrypted, so that's not likely to be of any use to anybody. And payment details weren't encrypted either, but that one didn't even get too much publicity, which is crazy. Um, Dropbox and Yahoo were a little bit different. We touched on them just before. Um, I believe Dropbox, which has had millions of passwords leaked. Uh, it wasn't actually their system that was compromised at all, it was people who were using the same password elsewhere. Somebody made a program that kind of just tested or verified all those programs on Dropbox's site and it got really quite public and a little bit sort of scary. But there's not much we can do. As users, it's part of it all. And there's, it's not, there's nothing to be really scared of, it's just the internet has got lots of features and this is just one of the places we need to be a bit wary. In 2014 alone, we've had three big name issues happening when it comes to security and technology. Uh, Heartland was the biggest one, which is just so very cool. It sounds super serious, and as far as internet security goes, kind of was. Uh, it was the encryption that we talked about earlier. It was kind of a huge gaping hole in how that worked that pretty much rendered it useless. 
apparently it had been going on for a really long time and may have been exploited by lots of lots of <coughs> organizations, but we don't really know for sure. So that was like uh, 80% uh, of websites were in some way infect, uh, infected or vulnerable to the Heartbleed exploit. And they're constantly being fixed. Uh, Shellshock and Bad USB um, are also other ones. Shellshock affected Linux and Mac computers, as well as Android phones, and that's a really new one still being patched. And Bad USB is like all USB flash drives. There's a potentially a, a firmware problem that is going to take a decade or more uh, to fix because. Um, viruses and, and malware can actually be stored in the firmware, not in the storage compartment. So it doesn't matter if you delete everything on there, it can still live on there. Really, really interesting stuff. We'll have to see what happens in the future for that one. Next one, jump to shopping online. Have either of you guys been shopping, done any shopping online? eBay. eBay, yep, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, a bit of shopping. Well, of course, it's for many, many people now. It's the first place we go. We, sit on the computer for half an hour and do research before we even leave food. Um, most people tend to shop at the big local retailers, Harvey Norman's, JB's, Officeworks, uh, because the benefit of buying from their online stores is you can bring it back. You've actually got a shop front you can go to if it isn't what you expected for what any, whatever reason, which is really handy. But there are other really big sites like Watch of the Day, uh, which is a huge website. It's the biggest uh, online retail outlet in Australia. It's just massive how big it is. Things sell every four seconds or something like that. It's crazy. Um, they're also quite reputable and once websites get that big, there's generally a lot of scrutiny in regards to their, their policies and their procedures so they sort of become safer by default, which is good. eBay, of course, is a, a fantastic one. We all lo love eBay. It's just it's so convenient and you can get things from overseas for delivered for under a dollar and kind of wonder how they even shipped it. It's amazing. Yeah, so and eBay of course and everywhere you look around, PayPal is fantastic. It's owned by eBay and it's kind of a really cool means of transferring money over the internet. The best part about it is the person you're buying from never actually sees your credit card details or any of your banking information at all. So they just get a notification that says this person from this email address has sent you X amount of dollars, click here to collect it, and that's it. So you don't have to trust anybody with your, your credit card or banking information when you're using PayPal. Plus there's often insurance and lots of safety nets that look after buyers. PayPal really favors buyers much more so than sellers, so you're in a great position if you can buy with PayPal. A little reminder though, no matter who you buy from on the internet, you are providing lots of information, not necessarily your banking information, but your full name, street address, contact number, and of course your email address. That's in, um, that one dollar item that I bought on eBay that I was wondering how it got delivered. Well, that person kind of just scored a lot of my personal information just by posting me something, which is part of it. Unless I use a PO box or something like that, or a fake name. Um, they've got a lot of information in an age of kind of identity theft and worrying about that sort of thing, it's, it could potentially be something to look out for. I read once that an email address is worth a dollar on the internet. Um, it can be an email address that has somebody reading the mail on the other side is worth a dollar. It can be sold on for marketing purposes over and over again. So just the email address alone has a, a value on it. But none of this should detract from shopping online because there's just so much to that we could be worrying about, and most of the time, it's just like the odds of anything happening are very, very low. But if we look out for encryption, and this was affected by Heartbleed, which was that um, that huge security issue that I mentioned just before. But right here we're at google.com.au, and we can see something a little bit interesting here on the Google page, and that's that we've got a padlock there. And have any of you seen the padlock around? Seems a bit inconsistent, but it is on roughly half the websites out there, depending on what the websites are. And it also says HTTPS. That S stands for secure. Uh, and that means that the transmission between you and Google is encrypted. So while technically possible for it to be accepted using supercomputers and all that sort of stuff, it's really unlikely that there's somebody snooping on what you're doing here on this website. Google recently implemented this, which is 
kind of cool, um, considering the content that most people enter there might be like an electrician in Bayswater or something like that. It's not necessarily content that you think is particularly sensitive. But lately, Google has really taken an interest in security. So every single one of your searches on Google.com are encrypted. They're not. They're not being watched by anybody. It's very cool. If we swap to the next tab on our browser here, here we're at PayPal, and as we would expect, PayPal is a payment processing website. So quite naturally, we've got a padlock as well, and HTTPS as well. Fantastic. We're secure. Really good. If we go to eBay.com. We're not secure. So there's no padlock and there's no HTTPS. Seems a little bit strange, um, but not really the end of the world because in our next tab, as soon as we click log in, now we're secure. We've got a padlock and we've got HTTPS. So what eBay is doing there, they've decided that no matter what you do when you're not logged in, it's not sensitive. You don't need that to be. Uh, but as soon as you do log in, well then you've got street address information, you've got a whole range of different details about yourself that's worth encrypting. A lot of websites do this, they only encrypt it when there's a kind of a reason for it. Here on Catch of the Day, the shopping website we mentioned earlier, we're not encrypted, but we probably would be encrypted if we log in. This site gets a million or more hits a day, and I'm guessing there might be a a bit of a tax on the computer uh, to have to encrypt that many sessions for that many users. But sure enough, once we logged in, we would definitely be encrypted. And email is pretty much always encrypted. This is um, Outlook, which is Hotmail, Microsoft, uh, Live Mail. They're all the same. They're all Microsoft. And we've got HTTPS and the Padlock, which is great. So we can sort of assume that when the information is traveling from my invisible computer here, over the internet, around the world, to Microsoft in America, it's probably not being snooped around by anybody. Um, we don't know what happens once it gets to Microsoft's computer and their internal network, but we trust them, so we assume there's no holes over there. With that fantastically, or terrifying, and a little bit cool, the heart lead uh, issue, which is all about the encryption and the padlock, this is basically how it worked. Uh, this is a fantastic comic by XKCD, which is a great web comic uh, sort of website on the internet. It's just amazing. But the way that exploit worked was, this is uh, Meg. Meg asks the server on the other side of the world, hey server, are you still there? If so, reply potato. And this is just a random word. And they say, make sure the potato that you reply with is six letters long. And then in the busy, busy, busy computer world, it says, oh, user Meg wants six letters, and that six letters are potato. And then Meg does it again, it replies, Meg does it again, I want the word bird, four letters, Meg wants bird, and so the computer replies bird. Now, Meg's getting a little bit creative here. She's noticed the pattern. She says, hey computer, are you still there? If so, reply hat, but reply hat in 500 characters, not in three characters. So the computer interprets it and says, the user make wants 500 characters, and they're the word hat. He gets confused at this point and goes, hang on, the word hat is only three characters long. I'll just give Meg the next 500 characters that, 497 characters that are in my mold. And then Meg's got a little notepad and she's writing all this down. In the computer's log, we see all sorts of really kind of cool and probably information that we wouldn't want to be leaked out, but there's um, someone wants to change the password to this, Isabel wants to learn pages about snakes, but not too long. So all this information goes straight back to Meg, who's writing it down, and before you know it, someone has emptied the whole contents of the, the server into their own computer, and they've got everybody's passwords and lots of information. That's how Heartbleed actually works. It's crazy, and they only figured this out very recently, and it's been a, an ongoing thing for well, up to a decade or something like that, a really long time. But that's a great simplistic explanation about how it works. Apparently it's been resolved now for the most part, so you need not worry about it. But it is a great example of things that we really thought were safe that we were just wrong about. Like everybody thought SSL, the encryption, was flawless. We we're all using it. It's mainstream. But yeah, we just never know. Next up, we'll chat briefly about the cloud, which is totally inescapable. If the cloud is everywhere and everything nowadays, 
The best way to remember what the cloud is, is that it's your own personal USB drive plugged into somebody else's computer. And that computer might be anywhere in the world. So let's say this is Microsoft's computer. They've given me a little flash drive and they've said, Micah, we like you this much, we'll give you a 10 gigabyte flash drive. So they get their little flash drive and they plug it into their computer and they write my, Micah's name on it. And with that, I can store my photos, videos, and all that sort of stuff. It works by having the internet connect the user with that server wherever it is in the world, with Microsoft. So us little people, wherever we are, we don't have to be in Australia, we can be anywhere. We use the internet to connect to Microsoft server that has our flash drive in the back. And we can access whatever we put on that flash drive from anywhere in the world, which is really, really handy. Super handy. And it has lots of benefits. We can use the cloud for storing documents, photos, videos. We can put all our, our uh, holiday photos into there and then easily show friends or add photos to it while we're overseas and then empty our memory card and know that we've got a backup in the cloud with Microsoft or whoever. We can do file device, files and device backups. A lot of iPhones and Android phones back up the whole device constantly onto the internet. So if you lose your phone, you can just sign in on a new one and everything just comes back onto it. Really handy. All our email accounts that we've all been using for years are, are all cloud-based, especially the Microsofts, the Gmails, Yahoo's, all of those. They all live in the cloud. You can sign in and out on all your devices and your information just synchronizes in. Contacts and notes and, of course, purchases on your tablets or um, your iPads, they're all part of, they're in the, your Micah's little, a list in Micah's little flash drive that says, Micah bought this, Micah bought this, Micah bought this. So I can get them all later. But there are some good and bad things. Some of the good things are, of course, it's accessible anywhere. Your information is always there when you need it and it's backed up. We trust Microsoft that they've got all my information in Europe somewhere and another copy here in Australia, maybe another copy in America. So wherever I am, I can access it really, really quickly. And there's a backup if anything happens to either one. It's synchronized across all devices and platforms. I can delete a file on my iPhone here right now and it'll delete itself on my iPad instantaneously. So great, seamless, no need to copy files between places. Really, really good. Plus, it generally just works. There's no configuration, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to organize in advance. You can log into your cloud drive, your cloud drive from any computer anywhere in the world and access anything, which is great for if you are traveling and you've got passport, passport documents, insurance documents that you've got a copy on you, but if you lose that, then, oh, yeah, I'll get what you need. I'll just log in and grab it. Really, really handy for that sort of thing. But then there's kind of questionable parts to it as well. We're essentially trusting a third party with our personal content, which is fine for the most part because generally what we're storing isn't really that sensitive. But it can be. A lot of people store things that they might not want other people to access. Um, so then there's, there's issues of, well, would any of these companies tell us if a government or a third party or anything accessed our information? They really might not. It probably would look pretty bad if they let someone either uh, intentionally or accidentally uh, access our information. Then there's things like um, retention of ownership of your of a, a great photo you did and copyright and all that sort of stuff. Um, Dropbox has revised their their storage issues uh, or their storage copyright issues, but Facebook, I'm not sure if it's changed, but they used to have it that any photo you uploaded on Facebook of your friends or of anything becomes their property and they own copyright you. And if they wanted to, they could put it on a huge billboard in Times Square and it could be seen by millions. And that's okay, we agreed to the 76 page terms and conditions and privacy <laughs> policy. We all read it. <laughs> yeah, every word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all that stuff, uh, they're, they're things to think about. Um, we touched on who else is, is accessing my files because we, we don't know. And if we have passwords that accidentally end up in the wrong hands, Someone can grab all of our files from our, our cloud storage and they just become theirs, which is an issue. And security as well, like with the information, my images as they um, travel over the internet, are they encrypted? Are they encrypted on the server? Is the information really safe? What precautions are being taken? All great questions to ask and all kind of things that are good to keep in mind when 
using great these great services because they're really handy, but you know, at the same time, yeah, they're exactly. cautious. Any questions about the cloud? I know it's a, it's a, <laughs> where to begin, right? It's a really complex one. Kind of, it's it's really hard not to use nowadays because it is part of everything. Mm. I prepared a kind of to-do list on iPads here, yeah. so I wanted to share my iPad screen up there. And please interrupt me at any time with questions about regarding this or anything else, because iPads are great for a few reasons. One of the main reasons is kind of what was also a little bit of a burden initially, but they're it really it's a really closed ecosystem, so. Viruses generally aren't really a problem at all on iPads. Um, really, really handy because nobody wants a virus and that's something on a computer that we're all constantly worrying about. Um, so in, uh, in the iPad Apple world, there's only one place to get applications from and that's from the App Store. Because of that, well, it's kind of safe. Apple polices the App Store very, very closely. So for the most part, I'll just share my screen. There we go. For the most part, when I launch an application, here, this is Adobe Reader, which we probably most of us might have at home. Um, this application can't function outside of when it's on the screen. So I'm using it, blah, 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 as soon as I press the home button and quit, it can't communicate with any of these other applications. And that makes it sort of safe. So we know that Adobe Reader isn't going through our contacts right now and then sending them up over into the cloud. And we know it's not modifying core parts of the operating system because it doesn't have access to them. Which makes this, yeah, it's not a coincidence that we never hear anybody talk about viruses on iPads. They've got people, Apple's got people working on them very, very closely um, to be on top of that sort of thing because it would look terrible and uh, uh, if it ever happened. But it sort of seems like if it was going to happen, it might have worked. You're saying in your iPad, does that apply to tablets that are not Apple? Actually, not really. No, yeah, Apple tablets um, are sort of, they're in a, bit, they're a breed of their own. Um, they're really obviously very simple to use, but they're a little bit more pricey. Um, so Apple puts a lot of work into the operating system, and they're very closed off. Like it, it, for a while, it was impossible to make, um, let's say, with the Skype application. If somebody called me from Skype, but the Skype application wasn't running on the screen, then I couldn't receive a call because there was no way for Skype to send the message through to bring it up on my screen. So that's a great example of an application that couldn't run in the background, it couldn't do anything, even though it would potentially be helpful, um, because there were restrictions in place by Apple. On Android tablets, which are made by Google, uh, there's a lot more that's possible. If basically, if you can imagine it, then developers can kind of do it. Um, so they can have things that kind of run at startups. So as soon as you turn it on, something can pop up that can't happen on iPads. Um, if, you're, if it was a phone and not a, an Android tablet, then you could make it so when a certain person calls, send them to voicemail, or there are like core things that can change on an Android tablet, which is great because it's an open platform. It means you can be as creative as you want to be, but it also opens the door for viruses and, and negative things to end up on the device. Um, a lot of people who really love computers and technology end up with Android tablets because they want the freedom and the flexibility, whereas many people who just want a device that kind of just really always works um, end up with an iPad. They're easier to learn and they um, they're generally don't break as often, in my experience at least. Um, so I have an iPad um, because I love, I love the simplicity, despite being a massive nerd, I probably should have an Android tablet as well. I stick to an iPad because I need it to work. When I'm up here talking to you guys, I, I need it to not crash on the screen constantly. And, and I trust the iPad to do that, which is great. Um, we mentioned getting apps is all done through the App Store, which looks just like that. Have you got a, is that an iPad? Have you got that? 
That's a oh, no, 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 a comparable app for everything you can do on an iPad. If you knew how to get it. If you knew how to get it. Well, on Android, there's the Play Store, which looks like a... What kind of new version? Yeah. Yeah. I know how to use Play Store works actually in pretty much exactly the same way as the App Store. It looks a little bit different because it's Google's version, uh, but for the most part, you, you have a search box generally in the top right corner or along the top, and you can search for any applications that you're interested in. A great one that I use is, um, is Flipboard, which is kind of like your own personal magazine that I'll, I'll show a little bit later. But for fun, along the bottom here, we've got Top Charts. Click on top charts. We've got oh, kind of a nice list of what everybody else seems to be downloading. You probably have got. No, I think it is still top charts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, cool. Um, you can press this one. Yeah. And this is great. You can do movies, TV, music, books. You've got the opportunity to get any of those from the same place, which is really cool. I mean, it's a different application, so that's actually. There's lots to look at. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's say um, I'm looking in the middle column here yeah, for an application that looks like a little bit of fun. All right. Google, all right, let's, let's download the Google application. So this is, I believe, Google Search. I just tapped on it, and I've already downloaded this before, so I didn't need to enter a password. It just kind of remembered it. And as this goes around and gets back to 12 o'clock, it uh, it's downloading and installing the application for us. If I press the home button now, it works just like this on Android too. Yeah. If we close that now, and we go here, we can see it's downloading, and I've got a little bit of a collection happening here. It's got fast now. This works the same for any application, so we could use the search bar in the top corner and search for anything that interested us. So it's telling us that we can talk like instead of typing. I like that. Very cool. Yeah. How do you get that? <laughs> we'll sign in later. So, tap the mic button to try it out. So, oh, as soon as I tap the microphone, it's asking me if I would like to let this application use the microphone. That's a kind of nice little nifty feature. So we know that applications aren't listening to us when we don't want them to because we have to grant them access in the first place. Q 
cute animal pictures. Pictures of cute animals, here you go. Pictures of cute animals, here you go. <laughs> she talks. So the funny thing with that is that um, she knew, I said cute animal pictures. She automatically searched Google not for the word pictures, uh, sorry, not for the word cute animal pictures, but she searched for pictures of cute animals. So she picked up what I actually wanted and is showing me all sorts of crazy cute things. Uh, she's only listening when we want her to listen. Um, so if we do tap this. Eastern Regional Libraries. Yeah, it, it's, well, technically I suppose it is It is listening, but it's ignoring everything that we're saying, because it... it I can't do that here. You can, I think, Google, Google now. Google now. Uh, yes, so, one of the other niftiest features that I kind of love on this is, if we go to um, notes, but you can do this pretty much anywhere, notes, we'll do a new note. Okay, and if I tap the microphone, we can do really cool things like this. Hello, comma, how are you today, question mark. And it, you can just talk to it and it creates the sentences for you. And it knows, listens for the word comma and question mark and all the dictation. So, whenever it's really frustrating using the on-screen touch keyboard, you completely get rid of that. You can create huge emails and paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs just by talking to it. I went to the beach today and it was very hot, full stop. Have you ever been? Question mark. The water was very blue, full stop. And it just does it, just as you talk. Much easier. Something a little bit, a little bit kind of fun. Couple of other things that we're going to jump into. Ah. We of course have got lots of ebooks and audio books and all sorts of fun things like that. But I'd love to talk about um, catch up TV. Do anybody does anybody here use catch up TV at all on their iPad, on their computer, or anything like that? Yeah. I uh, do. Yeah, I do. No, I haven't used it, I've just heard about it. Yeah, uh, well, do you have an iPad or, or a computer? Yeah, you can do it on your computer too. Yeah, oh, it's just so very handy on an iPad, especially if you have an Apple TV or a Chromecast, which is something different for Android. But on Apple TV, we can launch um, iView. iView. So we can be sitting down on the couch at home with TV on in front of us and press play. This video has been classified and watch it as it on a computer screen. It is recommended for people aged 15 minutes. Better not play it then, for Um yeah. yeah, so we can watch watch videos through the internet and it gets sent wirelessly from the internet to the device and then to the TV. And this happens with how do we get it to the TV? I can understand how to get it. Yeah. On iPads, there's a little button in the corner that looks like that. That little blue screen. This one? Yeah. Okay. Not bad. No. This is a, it's actually only an iPad feature. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. Android. Yeah. Android. There's something called a Chromecast, which is made by Google, and it lets you do something really similar. <coughs> Yeah, it's um, it's normally $49 at JB Hi-Fi, but sometimes it's on special 
Um, so yeah, then really keep an eye out because it's it does it just almost a second. Yeah. Where can you see this icon? Yeah, you can see it. Good way it comes up on catch of the day. There you go. <laughs> catch of the day. Brilliant. Brilliant. So yeah, this is so handy. If you accumulate a massive watch list like I do, um, and feel like you're really falling behind, it's fantastic to just sit in front of the TV and go, okay, I watch that one, and then that one, and then just queue them all up and go for it. Really, really cool. And one other little application is Flipboard. Every day, I'm a little bit addicted. I wake up in the morning and I go on Flipboard. Flipboard is kind of like the newspaper, except it's half magazine, and it's completely live and constantly updating and free. So, we can set up topics that we're interested in. And they're like... Question, when it's not free, how do they charge you? How do you pay? Because, oh, well, it's always free. Um, this app is free and has always been. But they ask them to show some ads every now and again. So if we click on, uh, let's say, the technology, or maybe let's go what's hot in the top here. This is a what's hot magazine. It just changes itself, completely manages itself. We can flip through it just by turning the pages in the book. Yeah. And maybe if we keep flipping, we'll probably get an ad sometime soon. <laughs> but not too often, clearly. Um, if any of these were articles that we were a little bit interested in, uh, something about The Simpsons, something about a computer, we can just tap on them. And we can read it just like a magazine on the screen. Just like that. And then there's a back button in the top left corner. So this is super handy where you can just flick through, look at the titles. This is definitely on Android too. It works perfectly on Android. Um, so I've got topics for all sorts of different things that I'm interested in. And so if we go technology, um, I, this is the one I read every morning. I roll over in bed and I'm like, okay, let's see what's happening in technology. And we can see, yeah, all this, all this fantastic stuff. I've also got ones on the previous page for National Geographic. There's some for photos. That's the age, ABC. You can make these for any topic whatsoever. So you might not, I don't know, you might not need to buy the paper if you can have your own personalised paper that has all the topics that you're interested in, including um, the age or the Herald Sun or, or whatever your favourite pa paper might be. <laughs> Maybe. I know that in the app, in the, the Age app there is the crosswords, yeah. So this is, yeah, super duper cool. And there's one last app that I would love to show you, and that is, this is uh, Skywalk. If you like the solar system and you like and looking up at the stars at night, this is a great one. Not because, because there are those apps where you go like this and you look around and... This one's a little bit different. This one has the whole solar system sort of programmed into it, and you can... Not on Android. No, it's not on Android? Well, it might be. I'm not sure. It might be. So here we've got the sun over there, and there's the moon. It's a little bit tricky to see. Let's go, let's tap on Saturn over there, because it's a bit, there's a lot more happening over on Saturn. And we can move around Saturn in three dimensions and see all these moons, and we can tap on any moon that we like, and then click on the information. And this is Titan. We get heaps of, there's photos, there's general information, all of this amazing information, and we can move it around. And then, if we zoom out a little bit, so we get, we'll go back to Saturn. We can sort of hit play. Let's change. We can actually animate it. Let's go to days. So we can see how they all move around. And you can do this for the whole solar system and any part of the solar system. So when people say there's an app for everything, this is what they mean. It doesn't matter what you're interested in, there's, there's bound to be an app. But we're moving days. See in the top up there? We're moving just maybe a, a day, a day, maybe five days a second or something like that. You can see how the Earth, that's the Earth, so Jupiter's moving really slowly, Saturn moving slowly, as we move around the solar system. This is, what's this called? This is called 
Solar Walk. Yeah. Solar Walk. Yeah. Looks like we're going to have to get it. They said that one is new. Well, I really recommend that app. I, I, yeah, I, I spent hours just reading up on all the different worlds out there. Mm. That was a paid one. That one cost, I think, two dollars or two dollars fifty. Well worth it. Really well worth it. Um, of course, there's also Overdrive, which is our eBooks and audiobooks. Go to our bookshelf and read any book that we like. This is free and part of your library membership and you can um, download from anywhere in the world. So, and it works on Android too. Uh, and you can download what, like 20 titles at a time, keep them for three weeks and they automatically return themselves so there's no fees or anything like that. You can of course too um, tap there and change the font size to make it as big as you like too. Which can help yeah. as well. Then there's also audiobooks and oh, there's lots of lots of online content available through the libraries and it's all completely free too. So is there anything I call what airshine is that was uh, uh, to show it on the screen or the overdrive, this is the overdrive people. Overdrive. Overdrive, yeah. Overdrive, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, there's thousands and thousands of titles available. And you can do it from home too, so uh, on a rainy day when you don't feel like hopping in the car, it's a good way to access all your titles. Are there any questions about <laughs> iPads? <laughs> yeah. Come back next week. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah, what you can do too, um, we offer one-to-ones here, so you can bring in your gizmo and ask the team any question. To the best of our ability, we'll, we'll work through it with you too. So these sort of, sort of sessions are kind of just like, here's what's available, here are some of the coolest things. Um, what interests you, you can ask us at, at a one-on-one, -on -one and we'll talk you through absolutely anything. Yeah? Oh, I will, just before we fly away, um, display one other cool thing here. With the Apple operating system, you can go into settings, which on mine is the top left corner, but it's, it'll be somewhere on one of your home screens, and you can go to privacy, yeah, and we can look over all the different applications that have access to our files, uh, or our personal information. So if we click on contacts here, oops, we can see that the uh, print, a label printing application has got access Evernote and Google Maps asked, but I said no. So they, they're ones who are accessing or won't, aren't accessing my contacts. If I go to location services, which is of course your GPS location, we can see when certain apps are using it. There's a huge list. It feels like every application wants to know where you are at all the time. Um, we can do cool things like we can see if it's never allowed to access your location or only while you're using it or always, which means even in the background. So all these are like, you, you can kind of have a lot more control than what we ever used to have by going through all the settings and just saying yes, no, I don't want to be able to hear my voice, I don't want to be able to access my photos or my contacts. All that stuff is buried in there and the new version of um, Android, I think 4.3 or 4.4 onwards can also do something really similar as well because it's, it's, this is all really personal information. It's good to be on top of who can, who can access it. Because by default, they'll all try and access anything that, that they can. Mm. Mm. Any other questions? <laughs> no worries. Well, I'm going to hang out for ages, so yeah, you can ask me anything. Also, this tea and coffee someone has brought around, which is fantastic. If you feel like a cuppa. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for your style and your help. Ah, it's a pleasure. Remember, the e-learnings are here to help too, and they happen at all the branches. So you can book in for a one-on-one, -on -one and we'll make everything work with you.